located in the far reaches of the Western Pacific, deep within the tropics at 15 degrees north, lies a small little undescript island made entirely of coral and limestone known as Saipan. Fabled for D-Day in the Pacific, during World War II, thousands of Americans stormed this island to rid it of ruthless Japanese occupation. Today, the island has shown its appreciation by erecting the American War Memorial and listing all the brave souls that gave their lives to liberate Saipan. This massive amphibious invasion by the Americans took place along Saipan's great western barrier reef. Looking at a chart of Saipan, we can see that this coral reef is extremely large and extensive. It spans nearly the entire western side of the island and it extends out to sea up to one nautical mile. This large coral barrier reef is unique among Saipan's sister islands, collectively known as the Marianas Islands, which generally have steep shorelines with small coral barrier reefs such as Guam and Rota and Tinian. Indeed, Saipan's great coral barrier reef is its chief natural glory. And it is where we will begin our underwater discoveries of Saipan by exploring the many World War II wrecks left on the reef after the invasion of Saipan by those brave American troops. Today, the reef itself is a World War II heritage site and the hulks of what were once weapons of war now provide a safe and secure refuge for the many spectacular underwater creatures of Saipan. Welcome to Think Ocean. I'm Captain John, and in this episode, we're going to explore a sunken B-29 bomber and two sunken Japanese cargo ships. But first, we're going to start by exploring the most predominant feature on the reef, easily seen from shore, the turrets and cannons of three American Sherman tanks. Swimming along the southern end of the barrier reef, through the shallow waters of the inner lagoon, appears an ominous figure of a half-submerged World War II American Sherman tank. These Sherman tanks, for one reason or another, bogged down and couldn't make it to the beach. Rusted and decayed, she still stands strong with her cannon and turret aimed high with honor. Today, around the tank, eagle rays swim freely and they forage in the sandy bottom for food. Stingrays are also common and like the sandy bottom that is around the tanks. The tank itself 
provides a safe refuge for these juvenile sergeant major fish to grow up in. Here are some adult sergeant major fish and blue blennies staying close to the security from predators that the tank provides as does this handsome Moorish Idol. Fearless and devoted men once fought in these tanks, now in place where they last fought, frozen in time. They are grand memorials to their service to all of humanity. It is the southern end of the inner reef that is the shallowest. The depth is waist deep and the bottom is mostly sand and grass that the landing craft, which were launched from ships offshore, would broach the barrier reef and deposit their cargo of men and equipment. Here, where so many years ago, immense violence, suffering and death occurred. These shallow waters are, today, peaceful, tranquil, and full of life. One of the most common seashells found on the reef are these horned shells. Growing out of the sand, this healthy branching coral head makes a fine protection for these striped decilis and blue cornice fish. And this is where the saying, built like a tank, comes in. These robust machines are made of four inches to six inches steel supports and armored plating. After 80 years of being worn down by the harsh elements of the sea, they show little, if any, change in shape or structural integrity. Hard coral like this head of Acropora like iron and found a suitable substrate for growth on the tank's treads. As interesting and actually beautiful these tanks are to look at as they have come to rest during Operation Forager, 3,500 U.S. servicemen gave their precious lives, most of them Marines, and there were over 13,000 casualties. On our way to Tank 3, we will pass over the great seagrass field. This grass provides nutrients to the reef and supplies the inhabitants with food and refuge. Safety in numbers, this school of yellow chromis fish can easily dart in and out of the blades of seagrass to elude predators. To protect them from predators, this group of black anemone fish use the protection of the painful stinging cells of the anemone itself, which is growing out of the grassy bottom. Tank number three looms out of the shallow waters, like a ghost of grandeur, still in defiance towards her cause. Fierce fighting took place here, and it was a hard-won battle. American objective? To set up an airfield to which launch B-29 bombers and attack the 
Japanese homeland islands. Coming up, we will dive and explore a sunken B-29 bomber that shot up and crippled, came limping home, and crash landed in the shallow waters of the lagoon short of the airfield. Keeping a sharp lookout on tank number three is this beautiful, unique Cyclops sea urchin. Acropora coral has also found a suitable substrate on tank number three's iron treads. And close by, the two berm with its feathery-like appendages out to capture microscopic animals drifting by. Large colonies of coral can also find a home here, growing on rocks to become quite large, like this colony of yellow encrusting coral. The Japanese had cement gun emplacements set up on the beach to attack the Americans as they came ashore. And in a snapshot of time, tank number three's turret and cannon is aimed high and proud at a Japanese gun emplacement ashore. Today, these gun emplacements are painted to celebrate the beauty of the ocean. Next to some are Park Service information signs about the invasion to liberate Saipan from the ruthless Japanese occupation. And this placard in particular stands out as the most realistic of the harsh realities of war. It reads, Caught in, naval gunfire, the wounded and the dead increased. Most feared was the naval shelling which reached the obscure mountain caves where CP were located. The feeling of everyone is if they would only stop the naval shelling. At 0500, there was a fierce enemy air attack, and I have at last come to the place where I will die. I am pleased to think that I will die calmly in true samurai style. Naval gunfire was too terrible for words. Toward the evening, the firing died down, but at night, naval gunfire continued as before. She came limping home, half shot to pieces from a bombing raid in Japan. She crash landed in the waters of the inner reef, short of the airfield. She is a B-29 Super Fortress bomber. Her name is Emily. The skilled pilot did his best to bring her down gently. To his credit, the crew survived the crash landing. But to be sure, crash landing a four-propeller bomber gently into the water is challenging and problematic, to say the least. She hit hard, ripping off three of four propeller motors from the wings, like this one, propeller number one.
Airplanes are not built like tanks. And because it crash landed and it has been subject to the brutal elements of the sea for so many years, the wreckage is scattered all about. This is propeller number two laying down. Its propeller blades are bent, twisted, and mangled, showing the ferocity of the effects of a watery crash landing. This is propeller number three. Only one of the four propellers still attached to the wing. Forcefully and violently, it is bent down and now buried in the sandy bottom with its tips barely visible. Made only of flimsy aluminum, the rigors of the sea have taken its toll on this B-29 bomber named Emily and her pieces are strewn throughout the area. Ah, propeller number four, old glory as we call her. As the plane slowed, it was probably the last propeller to be ripped off. On the sandy bottom, she came to rest in a strong and proud upright position. If she found herself alone without fighter plane escort and had to protect herself from the enemy trying to shoot her down, the air crew would take to the small gun turrets. They were strategically positioned throughout the plane to provide countermeasure protection from all directions. Firing these 50 caliber machine guns at enemy aircraft in brave defense. The turrets are only made of thin aluminum and would hardly protect them from enemy gunfire and many courageous men died in them. And now we will swim through the area, making way from propeller number two to propeller number four. Up next in this episode, we will dive two Japanese cargo ships that were sunk during the war. The ship was caught inside of the inner reef of Garapan Harbor Basin by American Air Patrol and it was attacked and sunk, denying the Japanese enemy of vital war supplies. Today, this shipwreck has become a reef system 
and coral attaches itself upon it like this piece of grandis and snapper make a home in the wreckage and does a host of many other fish like these goat fish exploring the shipwreck can be fun however entering this gloomy narrow passageway can be very dangerous and should be only attempted by divers with a vast amount of diving experience like myself the steel of this wreck is over 80 years old it is thin rusted and weak one accidental bump or touch could have it all collapsing in, trapping the diver. Even so, fish, such as these Manpachi, are more adept and find it a wonderful home within the twisted carnage of this wreck. young sea turtle likes the wreck as a shelter and it is probably headed out to get a few breaths of fresh air. Sea turtles are vegetarian. Here this sea turtle is chomping on algae that is growing on the wreck. dangers of a shipwreck are everywhere, like these frames that have tipped over and are now leaning on the bulkhead, ready to fall down at any time. I follow my dive buddy, Ning Ning, through this collapsed passageway and deck. The metal is very fragile and thin from rusting. I'm very careful not to touch or bump it as it could easily collapse in. The wreck is like a fictional sea monster with tentacles outstretched in all directions ready to capture and trap you. It is true that most sharks need to keep moving in order to force water through their gills and thus oxygen through their gills. However, a few sharks can stop motionless and force water through their gills. One such shark is this white tip reef shark. At night, these sharks patrol the reef in search of food. By day, they normally rest still in sea caves with sandy bottoms. This wreck simulates just that and this shark is content here. Agitated and nervously moving around. This shark is bothered by my presence. It reminds me of my ex-wife. I must remain cool and calm because this is not a sea cave. It is a fragile wreck and one wrong move could have it all collapsing in on top of me. This is the cargo loading deck and seen here inboard is the open cargo hatch and combing. And outboard are the gunnels with open chocks to allow docking lines to pass through. Ning Ning has found a beautiful tiger cowrie. It is living and we will be sure to put it back gently and secure. The wreckage can be an unorganized, mangled mess with pieces strewn everywhere. Beautiful to look at, invoking a grand sense of adventure to be sure. But remember, danger is lurking around every corner. This pufferfish 
is enjoying the sanctuary of the rack. With its strong, bold teeth and powerful jaw, it eats clams, mussels, shellfish, starfish, and it even munches on hard corals. This is a massive piece of hard plated coral, secure along the starboard hull. As these goatfish swim along the foredeck through the mooring bits, let's get ready to dive the second sunken Japanese shipwreck called the Channel Shipwreck. It's a long swim, far offshore, about one mile out to the distant edge of the reef. The swim out is filled with intricate formations of the coral reef, backed by a white sandy bottom. And then it appears a small Japanese cargo ship used to run supplies between these, the Northern Marianas Islands. Lying in shallow water at the far point of the shipping channel, the reef offers little protection from the continuous onslaught of the sea. Even on a day considered calm enough to swim so far offshore, the wreck takes a pounding from the small waves at low tide. At the stern, a school of papillo gather along the hull. These fish are juveniles and are using the security of the wreck as a nursery. Soon, they will be full-sized amberjacks patrolling and dominating the coral reef. This is the after deck at high tide and a little bit calmer than the last view of the relentless sea attacking the wreck. This school of mostly banded tangs likes the surging rough waters. Small cargo ships, such as what was once this wreck, are known as trampers. They're able to deliver supplies into small obscure docks, harbors, or bays. And they don't stay long, and they quickly move on to the next destination. These are the foredeck hatch combings, and the ship is heeled over onto her port side, and the waves will slowly and methodically take her completely under. Swimming into the cargo holds, one needs to be very careful. As the water swirls around and surges up and down, dangers of cuts and bumps are close at hand. It takes a lot of experience to swim into confined spaces such as these cargo holds. A sandy bottom that can be easily kicked up, reducing visibility, debris everywhere, and free diving on a single breath through the cargo holds is not for the meek. Through swirling waters and a stiff current, it is a joy to emerge from the wreck free and clear.
passing by some old docking bits and a mooring winch. The current is strong passing through the opening adjoining these two cargo holds. Along the sandy bottom, the ship's ribs and frames broken in are clearly visible. Leading to a small crack in the bulkhead that once through will lead to the port quarter. And that is where these fish call home. Seen here are Moorish idols, butterfly fish, tangs, and an angelfish. The sea will take her. The sea will devour her. Split in two, she is spectacular and marvelous. She is beautiful. But to be sure, it is a dangerous place, where danger lies in a tranquil state ready to pounce when it's unexpected. Like a painted ship upon a painted sea, the ocean summons up reflections of a time past. It is merely a glimpse. Men once worked on these decks, but without a doubt, the American priority was to sink her and deny the Japanese enemy of vital supplies. Mission accomplished. Life of the sea flourishes on the wreck. Fish and coral, like this piece of grandis, will make this a wonderful home for many years to come. She is the Channel Shipwreck. My name is Captain John, and I'd like to thank you for watching another episode of Think Ocean. I was born in the sign of water, and it is here that I feel my best. The albatross, the whales, and you, my fellow aquanauts, are my brothers and sisters of the sea. Until we meet again, aloha.